I'm Terrence McNally here at Bioneers 2011, and uh, with me right now is Yoni Landau. Hi, Yoni. Hi, good to be here. Yoni Landau is the co-founder and director of the Cooperative Food Empowerment Directive, a national network and training program that helps students create sustainable food cooperatives on their campuses. And you can learn more about that at cofed, C-O-F-E-D dot O-R-G. As a recent graduate, he worked to launch a successful campaign to prevent the first fast food chain from opening at UC Berkeley on campus. And he helped raise over 140 grand for a cooperative alternative, the Berkeley Student Food Collective. So Yoni, is there a personal story behind your movement into food activism? I mean, what moved you to make mm -hmm. this your cause? Yeah, I, I, I remember actually as a kid, I was extremely picky. Um, no vegetables, um, even an onion in, in a meatball was extremely, I wouldn't eat it. Um, until college, really, I had never had any exposure um, to local foods or sustainable food. I remember getting into, into, the, into the, um, the protest and not knowing who Michael Pollan was. Uh -huh. um, so my place was actually much more from um, a kind of challenging corporate power perspective um, and a lot more about um, the resilience of communities and community ownership. I remember in high school, I did a lot of activism around the Iraq war. I, I remember wearing a shirt that said, homophobia is gay in high school. <laughs> Whoa, it's twisted, not, twisted. Yeah, it's not, that's not a popular shirt at most <laughs> high schools. Um, so that was kind of my background, I guess, as sort of a radical activist. And I saw food as a really effective vessel to take all these values that I was really passionate about and make it something that's very communicable um, and, and very positive. It's not no. The food movement is, is very that's rarely right. no. That's right. You're right. I mean, as much as they might fight against certain corporations or corporate actions, there's, this is one where you say, so what is your positive alternative? Exactly. Everybody has it. Exactly, right. So that was sort of my background, and I also had a camp counseling background, and so I saw just the power of having um, community spaces where people could create their own identities and culture together, um, you know, leading groups um, through, through workshops. And so that was sort of what was so exciting to me about creating, um, creating a cooperative and, and creating many cooperatives is, uh, especially students get the chance to really create their identities and create the world around them um, and create the culture that they want to see. Um, that's also tested by, you know, a bottom line business reality. That's right. No, I, I, what I appreciate is that, uh, call it whatever you will, a student food collective, it's a small business. Yeah. And, uh, and so everyone that comes in is learning both how to work within a cooperative framework, but they're learning yeah. how to run a business. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's very, it can be very challenging working with some of the most idealistic students oh, sure. on a college campus and, and trying to articulate to them um, why it is that it's important for them to sell more food or maintain margins. Um, yeah, a brief story. I was at sure, the Kresge yeah. Cooperative um, in Santa Cruz, very radical space where they sell very local organic food, and I was meeting them um, on some Sunday. They were having a meeting, and I came in, and they were in this big pillow fort in the middle of their storefront. They had actually created a fort of pillows and blankets, and they were having their business meeting inside of this pillow fort. And I was coming in to talk to them about you know, their business plan and being a part of our national training network. And so I sat down with them and I just talked to them about how amazing it was that they had this chance to create this fort you know, that they could sit under on a Sunday and have their meeting. And what amazing thing it would be if they could expand that fort, if they could sell more food, if they could make sure the business was sustainable, if they could include more people under that fort. Yeah. Yeah. Tell, tell us the story, Yoni, of the Berkeley Student Food Collective. And by that I mean sort of if this were the movie, right? Sure, okay. Right? So there's, right. there's life is, is normal and suddenly something happens and sets mm -hmm. you off in motion, you and your right. colleagues and your allies in motion, and then obstacles you overcome, and, and then this one has a happy ending. This one does. Um, yeah, I guess first it's really important just to emphasize the colleagues that were involved and just to say, I, you know, if I have a chance to talk about this, it's because so many amazing people were involved in this story. And it started with a Panda Express um, trying to come onto the UC Berkeley campus and move into the Cesar Chavez Student Union. So they're going to put you know, this big neon sign where, where the free speech movement had started, um, where there was no other fast food chain Almost at the time. Almost sacred ground, right? Yes. I mean, some people felt like it was. And many, many people felt like it wasn't sacred ground and that the, the university's bottom line was more important than its history, its heritage, and its culture. Um, so there was a protest. 
Um, but there wasn't that much traction around the protest, even though very competent, amazing individuals were involved in organizing it because there was no alternative. Um, and so eventually we got the idea, why don't we suggest students will run a cooperative sustainable food cafe um, as an alternative? And we got momentum around that, and we, we wanted to show them we were serious, so we did our business plan. We wanted to show them serious, so we, we did our grant writing, you know, we costed our menu, and eventually we got $106,000 in a matter of a few months, actually, from a, di a few different sources around the campus, um, and they voted against the fast food chain. Who's and, the they? Um, it was it's actually really funny. The Store Operations Board, SOB for <laughs> short. It's actually the body that was deciding. So, it was so just a few of, different they're administrators. Part of administrators. They're basically who administrators. What yeah. Can be on campus. And so we we would bring you know sixty people to their meetings, and this is a pretty obscure board that yes. generally they don't have anyone coming to their meetings. We don't want this Panda Express, you know. And we present our business plan, and then they'd be like, okay, table it. Like let's. They won't come back. And so next month we'd bring ninety, <laughs> you know. And at one point we got a front page story in SF Chronicle, and all of a sudden they had to take us seriously. And then once we had the grant money. Um, there was just so much momentum, momentum yeah. that they had to vote no. So they ended up voting no, and, and there's, there's no Panda Express um, at UC Berkeley, though. Um, unfortunately, we weren't able to stop the tide of, of franchises completely. There's a subway now, ironically, 100 yards from another subway right off campus. Um, <laughs> we, there, was no, there was no way we were going to yeah. stop. Yeah. <laughs> so um, so you, you raise the money, you start the now, but still, raising the money, getting them to reject Panda, you still had to find a location, mm -hmm. and you had to really start a small business. So what yeah. happened then? Yeah, oh my god. Well, it was a year of lease negotiations and revised business planning. Now, let me, um, let me I'm going to jump in for one second. Yeah. You got young people. You got enthusiasm. <laughs> yeah, people does with my hair. Does enthusiasm start mind. to flag when they suddenly go, well, this was fun when you know, when um, it was moving quickly, but this is off, this is like watching paint dry. You know, you'd think it would when you get into business planning and filing articles of incorporation, um, but somehow the, the challenge and the vision of creating your own space, you know, we had, we had 50 people in, packed into a tiny room at, at our first meeting to create, to create the business. It's like, what do we do with 50 people? I don't know, put them on committees and give them action items. Um, and they, they, you know, it, it did, it did, you know, it didn't maintain that 50 sure, people because sure. you can't use 50 people to start a business in the end, really. Um, but it didn't, it didn't flag. No, I would say, I would say it, it stayed fairly steady. That's Eventually, exciting. we hired, we did hire full-time staff. Right. We realized that, well, the leadership is going to transition. Let's spend some of our grant money to make sure that we get to opening. So we hired an amazing full-time staff. Um, but very small, right? Two or three? Or? One. One. We, we hired one full-time staff to do the opening, and then we hired a different full-time staff um, to actually be the store operator um, and support oh, it. Okay. So it, it, it did open. Um, it, it's important to note that we were negotiating with the people who wanted to get Panda Express into the space. There was a small business that was excited to bring, bring this yeah. giant in. We were negotiating with them, but we had just stopped Panda Express. Right. That was going to make them some it was money. Gonna be, yeah, it was going to be helpful for them. So they weren't, it wasn't the easiest yeah. lease yeah. negotiation. No. So we ended up actually moving into a different space um, very close by. Um, so we didn't get the space that we were looking for, but it's a beautiful space. Um, it is open. It's been open for about a year. Um, and the, the projections show that we're, we're hitting break even yeah. at, I, at a year. I, I, I actually uh, came up here uh, last summer bringing my stepson to visit Berkeley College, mm. and I think that's where we ate. Yeah, <laughs> Berkeley Student Food Collective. It's just below Telegraph on Bancroft. Yeah. Very good. That's definitely yeah, right? out there. Um, and the current status is operating. It's doing operating. Okay. It's doing well. Now, yeah. so you you still have a very very small staff. So is it mostly volunteer? Um, yeah. The way the way the Berkeley Student Food Collective works is there's one um, one main staff person, and then there's a lot of volunteer. And the volunteers are also the board, so okay. they they supervise the one staff person that they've hired basically. And I, I mean I have to say that. I haven't been involved, you know, I've, I've basically handed it yeah, off, yeah. and then but they've I'm just done an amazing job. Staffing something with a bunch of volunteers is much more logistically challenging than hiring six people. Certainly, certainly. <laughs> it's, it's doable with a grocery store, and anytime you get more value added, so anytime you're doing more prepped food, um, it becomes harder and harder I, to I use volunteer you. labor. Okay, so then out of that grew the um, COFED, right? Which yes, is the Cooperative Food Empowerment Directive to, to help start more uh, cooperative cafes and markets on college campuses. And how are you doing with that? 
Um, we're doing great. We just hit our two-year mark as an idea this month. Um, and essentially what happened is we had all the success and media um, figured a really effective way to leverage it would be to take my background as a camp counselor actually and run a summer camp for students who wanted the same experience. Um, so you have a vision of what you want on your campus. You want to leave a permanent legacy. Um, COFED is going to be the training program um, to help you and your team get from an idea into a business plan. So you've plan. done that. Have, have, are, there, are there cooperatives starting on other campuses? There are, are cooperatives there are starting. Yet, there are none that are open. Like I said, we're two yeah, years as an idea, of course. Um, we give people about two years to open. We just did our first training a year ago last summer. We trained six teams across the West so Coast. So what, what, what schools are seriously working on this? Mm -hmm. So our first six pilot teams were uh, UC Davis, UC Santa Barbara, uh, University of Washington, Humboldt State, and City College of San Francisco, and Cal Poly San Luis cool. Obispo. And so out of those six, um, in Seattle and in Santa Barbara, they had immediate successes almost and got funding and secured a space. In Santa Barbara, they'll be opening a mobile-powered solar food cart that's collectively run. Very good. So is your vision of this, and do you feel like it's getting the kind of traction that this is a national movement? Yeah, well, we, so we took that success, those early successes, and we decided let's train recent graduates to run training programs on both sides. This year, we trained 14 teams on the East and West Coast. Um, and it's definitely more than coastal. We have teams from Kalamazoo, from Alabama, from Florida, from Texas, that are all using our resources. Um, but anyone who's been involved in starting these kind of projects know that you have to be strategic about how quickly you grow. Yes. So as the movement grows, we're figuring out um, how to how to grow with it and where not to grow and where maybe And I hear already, in other words, you're not going to run around the country doing all the training, train Certainly people to not. train other people and so on. And are, are they all looking at food co-ops or are some of them looking at other businesses? The design is that we want a college student on any campus to see the alternative economic models that are sustainable, transparent, and community owned and accountable to their community work and that they leave college with an understanding that this isn't a fringe thing. This isn't a housing co-op that just hippies live in. It's actually something that can make a real impact to create a more sustainable community-oriented economy. Um, so we're, we're really focused on creating cooperatives. Um, though if it's a market or if it's a mobile food court or if it's a cafe, that's not important. It's just important that the vessel of food and local, sustainable, healthy food is really clearly at the center. So then it sounds to me like you also fit with the Real Food Challenge. The Real Food Challenge incubated us as a project. Oh, and tell people what the Real Food the Challenge is. The Real Food Challenge is a national network of activists that are trying to get a billion dollars of dining service money pushed towards more local um, And how do they define real food? They have the Real Food Challenge guidelines, which we're also using, um, that define food that's real as humane, ecologically sound, community-based, and fair. Those right. Are the definitions. Right. Yeah, I got, nailed those. Yeah. Um, so yeah, the Real Food Challenge has been a great ally. And so that's a much bigger movement, right? That that, that, that includes that, that includes caught. all of the folks that are looking at school gardens. That's right. But it also um, means what they're trying to do is influence the the regular food services, right? Absolutely. Because the only way a, a campus becomes, I think, what are they going for, 20%? 20% by 2020. By 2020 of this to. real food. The only way that works is if you get the actual bureaucracy that's been right. doing this for many, many years yeah. to come so over. So their, their design is a little bit more about auditing university yeah. dining services and lobbying, and we're, we're a little bit about more creating alternative infrastructures. So let me ask you this. Um, I sort of believe that what, what makes someone a pioneer, or that they'll say, yeah, yeah, that, that term fits me, is that you actually learn from natural systems. You kind of look at natural systems and learn mm -hmm. from them, and then try to act as if you're part of nature. How does that apply to what you're doing? There was something amazing that was said by Carolyn last night. Um, she said, I think she was quoting Car someone else. Carolyn Casey. Carolyn Casey, thank you. Carolyn Casey said, if you want something to heal itself, connect it to more of itself. If you want the ecology to heal itself, connect it to more of itself. Um, so our work is about cultivating a more community-oriented culture through college campuses. Um, and the design is that 
if you have a lot of rich relationships that are connected to a more sustainable planet, um, you can have people be more civically engaged, um, identify as participants in their world instead of consumers. And so what you're saying is that that is the way it is in, in nature. In nature, you can't be disconnected from. Yeah. Yeah, it's just it's a simple it's a simple simple question of connection, I think. Yeah. And then let me ask one other question. This will be the last one, which is I believe that story, and you saw the way that we approach the start of this interview, but I believe that story is the way that ideas, concepts, movements get into people's hearts and get into people's lives. What sort of stories are you telling these days? Hmm. I guess I'm telling stories like the story of Dom, who's at City College of San Francisco. Um, Dom is a first generation American. Um, his parents are lower um, and he's been struggling through college. He's been struggling because he doesn't have the money to both pay rent and spend a lot of time commuting from his home to City College of San Francisco. Um, and he got really passionate about food and he saw that he had a future um, creating the kind of sustainable food infrastructure that COPED is working with. And him and his team at City College, um, which is actually in a very, um, a very poor place in San Francisco, it's quite a food desert, have created the first farmer's market at a city college. Um, That's powerful. Yeah. So Dom has had amazing success and sees himself as a leader now in his community. Very good. Okay. Thank Thanks you. a lot, Yoni. Thank you. Yeah.